Oh, yes, another thing that came also, this Aina, and I will show you the pictures, is a paloma. Uh, I'm sorry, pigeon. Pigeon, pigeon in, in English. And a uh, significant number, almost you know, 400 uh, small birds, but they die from another cause of the flamingos. They electrocution, or they electrocute themselves. Well, I'll, you'll see some pictures. Oh. So, this is one of the first pictures that uh, the Bolivian expert uh, sent it to me. I you know, have bad news from the field. I said, okay, you send me pictures of rocks. What is that? <laughs> a landscape with rocks. And I get a closer look, and these are, you know, flamingos. Flamingos, buddy. One, two, three, four, five, six. We had set six on this time. And it's uh, quite clear to us and quite clear you know, to the researcher that they, the cause of their death was collision. They had uh, these, all these flamingos had uh, neck fractures and wing, wing <coughs> fractures. And they were found right at the bottom of the line without no uh, obstacle. These results, as I mentioned, you know, were not what we expected. And uh, as I mentioned, they are about 4,000 flamingos that are present in this, the region, you know, compared to uh, the 60,000, 65,000 uh, down there. On average, you know, we had three dead flamingos per week. So if we just do a simple extrapolation, much worse, you know, could happen. And we assume, and our researcher assumed that actually we had much more uh, fatalities because a lot of them, you know, may have been taken, you know, entirely by predators. So right after you know they collected the bodies, you know they used to to uh, enter to dig, bury them to avoid you know further uh, you know or predation or to attract uh, predators. These results uh, indicate to us uh, that even if we can make some extrapolation to what can happen you know further south, uh, there are some you know uh, factors, risk factors that we have to consider. Further south, the population of flamingos is. Up almost 12 times more, and we the, we have observed them when they fly that they fly with 30, 40 individuals, and over there this existing transmission line, they fly between you know 10 and 15 individuals, so you know, larger flocks can expose them to more risk. These uh, further south also we have a back and forth movement, so even if the probability remains the same as you know further up north at the end of the season, just because of the highest number and the back and forth movement, we can have you know, an absolute numbers of dead flamingos that could be pretty impressive. The other thing that we uh, have to keep in mind is that further south, as I mentioned, the Lagoon uh, Colorada is a reproduction site. And uh, the reproduction sites, the chicks are born there, and at three months, they start flying. And they're not very good flyers. They're less experimented. You know, they're, they're parents. They're clumsy. And we have no much indication at what altitude they fly, except that they fly lower. So it is one thing from our, you know, as an environmental practitioner, and we want to preserve, you know, the environment. It is one thing, you know, to lose, you know, adult flamingos. But if we start losing, you know, chicks, flamingos, it may have a significant impact on the long-term survival of the population, especially for a vulnerable population. So the key findings are uh, that uh, after you know this research, and it's still ongoing, and it will uh, uh, start again, you know, for the next uh, summer summer season, is that the transmission line is not only close to a critical habitat, which is the, the Lagoon Colorada. It's right in the middle of it. On both sides, uh, you have other wetlands. They travel back and forth, and there's this spatial mobility of uh, flamingos, reproduction sites, and feeding sites. In parallel to the studies, and I did not mention uh, this at the beginning, we also asked the consultant, the, the researcher, to do studies on the uh, phytoplankton, periphyton, diversity that is present in other wetlands. And I just got the results uh, last week, fresh new, brand new. Each wetlands, and you have almost 28, 30 uh, wetlands, there's different uh, types of algae, different type of uh, uh, diatoms. So our assumption, and the assumption of our researcher and my colleague also, is that 
these birds, the flamingos, you know, they travel the back and forth to complete their diet. They need uh, all this diversity of food in each wetlands to meet their nutritional needs. So it's a feeding route. It's on the other side of a uh, reproduction site. And what is clear to us also is that they do collide on a transmission line. If there is no mitigation device, uh, independently also of the weather condition. So next steps in two minutes. <laughs> Let's call it two minutes. Uh, we want to keep uh, going and do the studies. We want to build a stronger set of data. We have to be cautious, however, about the mitigation device that we can implement on the transmission line. In the last couple of months, you know, I initiate uh, talks, conversation with other, in other parts of the world, especially in Namibia and Botswana, where there's also uh, flamingos that travel back and forth, and they were starting to test mitigation device, but apparently there's one that's functioning so well that flamingos never go back to uh, all near, near the line. And we don't want this in our case because it's a feeding group. So we need a mitigation device that will give them you know, a warning so they can fly over or they can fly below. But the visual fields also, we have to take and keep into account that the visual fields of flamingo is limited. They travel by night. They have low maneuverability, so it might not be successful. We also have to ask our question as a practitioner, mitigation device are not 100% effective and how much we're willing to lose. How much adults, how much chicks, what is the threshold for vulnerable species? So there's a complex questions. I was, uh, it was suggested to me, to my colleague also, to focus our studies on the flight altitude of these birds and not just the transmission line uh, to minimize impacts. But the last six months, the, the studies on the flight altitudes, there's a lot of variation. Some days they may fly at 30 meters, other days at 60 meters. It simply depends you know, on the wind uh, condition. So we cannot afford to base our mitigation strategy simply you know, on their, their flight altitude because it's not uh, constant. And there's also this aspect of, so there's a lot of technical challenges in implementing efficient you know, uh, mitigation device over there. Uh, it's a rough environment, there's no infrastructures, and there's no much uh, capacity also in Bolivia to uh, do the monitoring of this. And actually the study that was done, the collision of transmission line, was the first to be done uh, in Bolivia, and the second one to be fully documented you know, in the world on uh, collision uh, transmission line with flamingos, for the first one being in uh, Namibia and Botswana. Thank you for your time, and I'll welcome your question at the end of the session. Well, thanks very much, Genevieve, for a um, very interesting, uh, illustrative uh, presentation. Um, I would like to ask if, if there are any questions now, like one or two that we can take just for, for the discussion will be at the end. Any questions? Okay, I, I, I do have one, and um, uh, I know that you are focusing more on, in, on flamingos because of the one of the species is um, uh, in the list as vulnerable. But um, what what will be done if, if uh, for example, as you say, well, you cannot focus the results in terms of the altitude of what they are uh, at, at what they are flying. But if you have all the other list of species that are also a problem, let's say they are because they are also colliding with the with the lines, uh, will the studies be really focusing also in, on the other species or just specifically on the flamingo? This is a good question, specifically that we didn't expect as much as Paloma, you know, dying from the, the, the electrocution of the transmission line, but when. For us, for the time being, you know, our focus is on the flamingos because they are all listed in vulnerable or near treatment. And the, um, our position, also what we're going to do with that and the effectiveness of the mitigation measures will determine if the IDB remains involved in the project. And the Paloma, we have, unfortunately, we have less concern. But we certainly, you know, uh, in the next year, we'll do more research and we'll investigate what could be done. Because they are, they are dying mostly for electrocution. So the mitigation device is also 
the, we have something that exists, it's simpler, but we, uh, for the time being, we have to focus on flamingos. Thank you very much. So, oh, there's an office. My, my question is, if you can anticipate us, uh, which are those measures in the countries that you you mentioned that, that has been successful in, and if, if those measures uh, uh, are specific to flamenco, flamenco species in, in those countries, or are for other kinds of birds or, or species? Thank you for your question. Uh, well, I can tell you what I learned about these, you know, passionate fields and that didn't know much about the, about a year ago, is that uh, what's going on right now in Namibia, Botswana, what is uh, effective is a combination of devices, ones that produce a vibration, kind of a sound that reveal the flamingos, but actually it's working too much. And as I mentioned, we don't want to have this. And the other device that works is a spiral, uh, bird flappers, a, a spiral. Uh, so these two, and the one that produces vibration, that function with a solar power. And we may have some challenge implementing this in uh, Bolivia. But what we want to do in the next coming year is to test various mitigation devices and determine you know, their efficiency to figure out what is the best one, what is the most appropriate for the condition that we have in Bolivia might be totally different also in uh, Namibia, Botswana. But uh, we have to find something. <laughs>